Hi everybody, my name is Pavel Rzhov. Thank you very much for joining me. I'm a protein structural biologist and I'd like to talk about a, a company that has been in the news for the last couple of weeks, uh, which is called DeepMind. And their claim to have solved the protein folding problem or, or problem of uh, obtaining protein structures without uh, relying on existing um, let's say experimental data and I'd like to talk about this particular uh, company the their algorithm called AlphaFold what I personally think about uh, their claims uh, so provide you with uh, my personal uh, thoughts on it just from the point of view of protein structure biologist experimentalist at that and uh, I would really be curious to know what you think if you're also in the same field I'd really like to um, uh, find out more about how you think about uh, their claims and without further ado let's just get started I'm really excited about this topic okay so uh, protein structural biology is obviously a, a field that has been around for many many decades ever since we uh, found out um, that proteins are made up of amino acids and discovered that they're essentially beads on a string um, uh, we were obviously very curious how do those amino acids really interact with one another to create those complex three-dimensional shapes and obviously when you start looking at uh, proteins from just mathematical standpoint the amount of combinations of how those amino acids can interact with one another there's 20 of them in total that can uh, be attached to one another in the chains of upwards of several hundreds of uh, amino acids long if not more you start to realize that the amount of possibilities is just endless really it's so much that it's almost impossible to compute without some kind of constraints so this is what we call a protein folding problem in essence and is being able to predict what a protein structure would look like from its sequence now there is uh, experimental ways to solve protein structures like x-ray crystallography nuclear ma magnetic resonance spectroscopy such as what i've done cry electron microscopy and some other methods as well but those are the main three um, uh, x-rays rely on uh, growing crystals of proteins in, in the saturated solutions and then uh, putting them into an x-ray beam uh, obtaining a diffraction pattern and then calculating um, from that diffraction pattern electron density of the proteins and then essentially uh, obtaining a structure of a, of, a, of a protein in its crystal lattice. Local magnetic resonance spectroscopy relies on uh, the fact that all uh, atomic nuclei have actually magnetic spins that can resonate at different frequencies. If you apply uh, a radio frequency pulse to it, you can understand uh, how they correlate to one another in, in, in space, which of them are closer, which of them are further away from each other and how does chemical environment that is surrounding them really affect uh, their resonance so all of that com all of that information is actually used in this fairly um, long um, pipeline of experiments that you do that is used to generate enough data uh, restraints data to calculate a protein structure this can be done in solution this can be done in solids uh, so this is nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. This is what I've uh, I've done for uh, in my PhD. Cryo-electron microscopy relies on uh, quick and fast um, uh, freezing of your samples, and then using uh, electron microscopy to take images of those grids where you have your protein solutions or other molecules, and different at different orientations using fancy algorithms to. Uh, uh, converge on an, electro de on an electron density and then use that to uh, uh, find out the protein structure. So uh, there's a whole bunch of computational work that has been already done in parallel to all of this to uh, try and come up with an uh, algorithm that would um, predict protein structure pretty accurately and uh, uh, all those algorithms would, uh, would be tested against one another at the biennial competition called CASP and this has been running for several years now and um, all those computational uh, works all those computational methods really were giving mixed results for for a long time because it's very difficult to predict protein structures you need a good data set uh, to train your algorithms on 
and majority of those algorithms were actually using X-ray crystallography data to predict protein structures. So this is a bit of a, a background to what I'm going to talk next, which is a DeepMind uh, AlphaFold algorithm, which is their uh, algorithm that they've introduced um, a couple years ago, this AlphaFold 1. And uh, last end of last year, they introduced AlphaFold 2, which is a much improved algorithm that has such good efficacy as far as um, predicting protein structures, surpassing majority of the algorithms that have come before that. So essentially, in the news lately, you, you may have seen the fa uh, those articles that say, oh, AlphaFold 2 basically solved protein folding problem, which is, as I described earlier, talks about uh, predicting with really high degree of precision the structures of proteins without relying on um, uh, experimental methods such as the ones that I've mentioned already. So um, there is sort of, you can look at it from two sides. On the one side, uh, oh, it's really fantastic improvement because they use these machine learning techniques, AI techniques, uh, training uh, their algorithm on a very large data set of proteins and um, it does indeed uh, uh, show really high degrees of precision again surpassing pretty much everything that was before that uh, and there's like great great papers uh, outlining um, um, uh, outlining uh, how just how well this algorithm performs um, but uh, the the when we talk about protein structures one thing we actually tend to talk a lot less about and this is I would argue a lot less common knowledge is that not all proteins have a defined three-dimensional shape and not only that uh, the three-dimensional shape that proteins do have is in fact not static. It actually is very dynamic. It depends on, on the environment that the protein finds itself in. If it's in, the, uh, in one sort of set of pH or uh, with, uh, in proximity with certain types of compounds, it might have one uh, shape versus if it's like in the other compartment in the cell or outside of the cell near uh, and close to other types of molecules, it may have a completely different structure. So and that's very important to, to proteins function it actually is very flexible in its um, in its uh, structure there are some core uh, structural elements like alpha helices beta sheets it may even have retained majority of its three-dimensional shape but there's regions on the protein or it could be indeed the whole protein itself that can be disordered it could have like a random coil that has multiple conformations or the whole protein can be intrinsically disordered this is what we call IDP um, so those types of proteins where there is not a, a fixed structure to a protein are much much more difficult to predict because they just don't have a structure defined structure so um, uh, that's a very important subset of proteins and it's actually quite a large subset of proteins and more more so than not the function of proteins is actually related not to its fixed structure but rather on how that fixed structure changes with respect to the presence of let's say a substrate if we're talking about an enzyme or uh, maybe its localization in the cell like if it's next to a membrane if it's next to a, a particular type of molecule um, so how does that protein structure change with respect to its environment it's a very uh, famous and quite frankly extremely important uh, principle in protein structure prediction so uh, from where I stand um, I, I, I'm glad that we have this algorithm that uh, can just predict a protein structure if you just give it a sequence. It's, it's freaking amazing. Uh, but the, the, the something that we should be extremely aware of is we should always, always take these predictions with a grain of salt. Not because they're necessarily bad, but because there's regions of the protein which are, having mu which are much, much harder to predict using this algorithm because it's only trained on specific kind of data set typically x crystallography data set which just talks about rigid structures this is something that is very important to understand like x crystallography data when you look at the proteins it only shows really the secondary structure of the protein uh, by and large by that I just mean the the, the coils that are uh, the loops that are connecting those like alpha helices or beta sheets are typically much much poorly resolved using that technique and uh, on the other hand, like NMR, for example, actually provides you with information about dynamics, the, um, the time scales of the dynamics of those uh, regions, uh, 
so you can really differentiate between okay this region doesn't change its uh, its structure at all uh, on this particular time scale versus this region is very flexible and how flexible it is oh these are the dynamics on the say microsecond or millisecond time scale um, so NMR in that sense is much more powerful technique for probing those intrinsically disordered regions or uh, intrinsically disordered proteins in the first place so uh, that's extremely important uh, thing to to realize when we talk about uh, de novo protein structure prediction so that's why um, uh, looking at the data that this algorithm spits out ultimately we have to be aware that there are regions of those proteins that are just don't have you, you shouldn't have as much confidence and I believe that algorithm when you actually look at the the data that it produces it actually highlights the region of the protein that ha which that algorithm defines as it's confident a lot less in right you have like a 70% confidence 90% confidence 30% confidence something like that right so those are the regions that we should be paying close attention to and more importantly again as i mentioned earlier it, it's it the the regions where that confidence is low are typically the regions that are more flexible and the regions that are more flexible are more likely co corresponding to the regions which are actually very functionally important for like drug binding or for interactions with other molecules so that's something I really wanted to get across uh, from from sort of where I stand since I did NMR I really understand that flexible regions of proteins are the key to understanding truly understanding their functions so any drug discovery pipeline that you might use that you might be basing uh, by using these alpha fold uh, uh, algorithm in you have to understand that that's actually potentially a dangerous and slippery slope path because oh you can have an idea of how this protein looks like but the functional elements within that protein the ones that are very flexible those might be much harder to predict so you need other techniques you need those experimental techniques again such as NMR or other types of tools that probe the, the dynamics of those regions uh, a lot more uh, finely and pr allowing you to obtain the um, more precise information about that before you you just base all of your drug discovery pipeline on the output from those um, uh, from algorithms such as AlphaFold. So those are my personal thoughts, just sort of rooted in my professional background. If you are a protein scientist, please also comment below. Let me know if you think this uh, um, this uh, protein folding problem has been indeed solved by AlphaFold. I would be very curious to know. What you think and if you're just a life scientist or a member of the public also let me know what you think about this particular topic are you excited about using machine learning and how it's applied in life sciences what do you think about this particular story especially in light of what i was uh, what i was just saying and i look forward to reading your comments responding to you as much as i can thank you so much for watching please like and subscribe this video uh, subscribe to this channel if you found this content uh, interesting um, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thank you. Bye-bye.